My name is Samson, and this is my story. Here I am, shackled in a Philistine prison, blinded and chained by my enemies. It was not always like this. Let me tell you my story. My story is one of triumph and tragedy, of fierce battles and personal struggles. I come from the time when the Philistines ruled over the land of my people, and the fate of a nation rested upon the broadness of my shoulders. The Israelites had done evil once again in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed us over to the Philistines, who oppressed us for forty years. The Philistines were an aggressive people who inhabited the land to the southwest of Israel, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. The Philistines are referred to as Sea Peoples due to their long and illustrious history in the maritime world. During my time, the Philistines moved inland from the coast of Canaan. There they built their civilization. These cities were each governed by a tyrant. The Philistines were deadly enemies of me and my people. The Philistines were known for their innovative use of iron, which was superior to the bronze used by the Israelites for weapons and implements. My people's progress as a country was consistently hampered by the Philistines, who possessed superior technology in their weapons and pursued a more aggressive military strategy. My people simply could not deal with the Philistines' overwhelming military might. The Philistines worshipped three gods, Ashtoreth, Dagon, and Beelzebub, each of which had shrines in various cities. My birth is just as mysterious as I am. In those days, my father, Manoah, from the tribe of Dan, lived in the town of Zorah. His wife, my mother, was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. So one day, the angel of the Lord appeared to my mother and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. The angel of the Lord appearing to my mother generally appeared to be a man, yet his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. I would be a Nazarite. The vow of a Nazarite is a very sacred vow. When under the vow, people regarded themselves as specially devoted to God, leaving their hair uncut, drinking no wine, eating no grape products, and avoiding any contact with anything dead. Nazarites do not eat anything unclean. The Israelites had a rule concerning clean and unclean food. A clean animal was one that had hooves that were completely cloven and which chewed the cud. Clean animals were oxen, cattle, sheep, goats, deer, etc. Unclean animals were pigs, camels, rock badgers, and rabbits. However, my case is special. I would have this vow from the womb. My mother also had to share in the Nazarite vow during the time she carried me. Even the social structures in my time, the announcement that the child would be a son would have been especially welcome. A son would not only carry on the family name, 
but also provide leadership in the home and in the community. In the world outside Israel, the sun was also the key to a person's well-being here and now, as well as in the afterlife. So she ran and told my father that a man of God who looked like an angel appeared to her and told her she would become pregnant and give birth to a son. My father prayed to the Lord and asked for the angel to return to give more instructions about me. My father truly wanted the manual of my life. Lord, please let the man of God come back again and give more instructions about the son who is to be born. God answered my father's prayer, and the angel of God appeared once again to my mother as she was sitting in the field. So my father asked him, when your words come true, what kind of rule should govern the boy's life and work? So the angel of the Lord told him, Be sure your wife follows the instructions I gave her. She must not eat grapes or raisins, drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, or eat any forbidden food. I was to be separated and set aside for God's will. The angel of the Lord honored my father's request for confirmation, but he did not answer this request to know the future. He simply called my dad to obey what God had already told them to do. The angel of the Lord proved he was wonderful by doing a wondrous thing, ascending in the flame of sacrifice to heaven. And my father said to my mom, we shall surely die, because we have seen God. But she said, If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. My father perhaps knew what God said to Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. He feared that because they had just seen the Lord, they would shortly die. But my mother understood that God had not done so much for them to abandon them now. God's past work in our lives is a promise of his future care and blessing for us. My mother was an invaluable source of encouragement for my father's faith. She didn't criticize him. The prophecy came to pass, and I was born. The promise from the angel of the Lord was fulfilled. It was proven to be true. My mother named me Samson. In ancient Israel, either parent could name a child, but there were more reports of mothers naming their children more often than fathers. My name, Samson, consists of the Hebrew word for son, which means little son. As I grew up, the Lord blessed me. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir me. From the moment of my birth, it was evident that I was destined for greatness. As a child, I possessed a unique strength, surpassing that of any ordinary man. Yet like all men, I was not immune to the temptations of the world. In a sense, I was truly a man of my time. One day when I was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught my eye. This was a case of love at first sight. I saw this woman and instantly wanted to marry her. When I returned home, I told my father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. Timnah was a Philistine city in the land of Canaan 
It was to the east of our camp. My father and mother objected as I was going into Philistine territory. They asked, Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry? Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But I told my father, Get her for me. She looks good to me. And he accepted. She was right in my eyes. Love at first sight is a powerful but dangerous thing. Though arranged marriages are non mandated, this was the common practice at the time. Arranged marriages in my times often represented alliances intended to ensure the continuation of the families through offspring. My father and mother advised against such a woman. In Israel, marriages were generally within the clan or tribe, though there were no laws against marrying someone from another tribe. For an Israelite to marry a Philistine poses a special problem, a commitment to peaceful coexistence and mutual acceptance between the clans. However, I disregarded my parents, and I wanted this woman. My parents simply cared about what Moses said. Moses stated, We shall not intermarry with them, and not give our daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for our sons, for they will turn our children away from following the Lord God to serve other gods and the Lord God's anger will burn against us and will quickly destroy us. But I still wanted her. And after a while, my parents agreed. Now, my family would need to travel to Timna with me to get my wife. The day arrived and we set forth. At a time during the journey, I was by myself near the vineyards of Timna. It was a unique place as Nazarites were to have nothing to do with grape products in any form. All of a sudden, a young lion suddenly attacked me. At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon me, and I ripped the lion's jaws apart with my bare hands. I told you, I was unique. During my time, Asiatic lions were common throughout the Fertile Crescent. Indeed, the lion symbolizes chaos and the untamed world in all its forms. The lion was more like a young goat to me. I left that sight, and I didn't tell my father or mother about this event we had to complete our quest. When I arrived in Timna, I talked with a woman and was very pleased with her. Everything appeared to be going smoothly. Now I can go back to my home and come back here for my own bride. When it was time for the wedding, I had to leave home once again. During my trip, I came across the same place where I had slain the lion a while ago to look at the carcass of the lion. And I found that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. I scooped some of the honey into my hands and ate it along the way. A reward for a victor. I also gave some to my father and mother, and they ate it but I still didn't tell them I had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. I did not tell them because it violated my Nazarite vow, which stated that a Nazarite should never touch a dead body. As my father was making final arrangements for the marriage, I threw a party at Timna, as was the custom for elite young men. There would be seven days of pure celebration. Literally, this was a drinking feast. A seven-day feast at the home of the bride's parents, 
climaxing in the consummation of the marriage. The seriousness of the issue for me is heightened, inasmuch as my Nazarite status specifically prohibits me from devouring products derived from grapes. People were officially married when their families came to an agreement. The dowry and bride price were exchanged, and the match was officially celebrated. The marriage then was consummated, and the two became man and wife. When the bride's parents saw me, they selected thirty young men from the town as my companions. I was the man of the hour with my own audience. I said to them, Let me tell you a riddle. If you solve my riddle during these seven days of the celebration, I will give you thirty fine linen robes and thirty sets of festive clothing. But if you can't solve it, then you must give me thirty fine linen robes and thirty sets of festive clothing. All right, they agreed. Let's hear your riddle. So I told them, Out of the one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Three days later, they were still trying to figure it out. On the fourth day, they said to my wife, Entice your husband to explain the riddle for us, or we will burn down your father's house with you in it. Did you invite us to this party just to make us poor? So my wife came to me in tears and said, You don't love me. You hate me. You have given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I told her, I haven't even given the answer to my father or mother. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with me and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last on the seventh day, I told her the answer because she was tormenting me with her nagging. Then she explained the riddle to the young men. So before sunset of the seventh day, the men of the town came to me with their answer. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? The willingness of my Philistine wife to side with her people against me was a great heartache to me. With anger, I replied, If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. My wife won what she wanted through manipulation, but she lost my respect. I paid off the debt, but I did it at the expense of the Philistines. I executed thirty of these enemies. I went down to the town of Ashkelon, obliterated thirty men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men who had solved my riddle. But I was still furious about what had happened, and I went back home to live with my father and mother. Later on, during the weed harvest when I was calm, I took a young goat as a present to my wife. I said, I'm going into my wife's room to sleep with her, but her father wouldn't let me in. My wife was given to my companion, who had been my best man. What a best man! I won the battle but lost the war. My wife left me. I truly thought you must hate her, her father exclaimed. So I gave her in marriage to your best man. But look! Her younger sister is even more beautiful than she is. Marry her instead. I was mad, enraged. So, I said, this time, I cannot be blamed for everything I am going to do to you Philistines. My anger was truly let loose on her people. I took my time 
and went out and gathered three hundred foxes. I proved myself master of the beasts, first by overpowering a lion effortlessly, and later by capturing and manipulating three hundred foxes. I tied their tails together in pairs, and I fastened a torch to each pair of tails. Then I lit the torches and let the foxes run through the grain fields of the Philistines. I burned all their grain to the ground, including the sheaves and the uncut grain. I also destroyed their vineyards and olive groves. When the Philistines found out, they asked, Who did this? Samson was the reply. They explained that because of my father-in-law's actions. I had destroyed their fields. So the Philistines went and got my wife and her father and executed them. When I discovered what had happened, I made a vow. Because you did this, I won't rest until I take my revenge on you. I was in a thorough spiral of anger. First, I was deceived, and then my wife married someone else. Now she was executed. We have here the bitter story of retaliation, of trying to avenge wrongs done. I attacked the Philistines with great fury and eradicated many of them. Then I went to live in a cave in the Rock of Edom. The Philistines retaliated by setting up camp in Judah and spreading out near the town of Lehi. When the men of Judah saw them, they asked the Philistines, Why are you attacking us? The Philistines said, We've come to capture Samson. We've come to pay him back for what he did to us. So three thousand men of Judah went down to get me at the cave. When they arrived, they said to me, Don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? But I replied, I only did to them what they did to me. Then the men of Judah told me, We have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. I agreed but made them promise that they wouldn't kill me. Even though I am strong, I am not invincible. They replied, We will only tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. We won't kill you. The fact that soldiers from the tribe of Judah gave me up to the Philistines shows just how much my people were under the oppression of the Philistines. They would rather please their oppressors than support me, Samson. I submitted to them. So they tied me up with two new ropes and brought me up from the rock. As I arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph. But the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon me and I snapped the ropes on my arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from my wrists. Then I found the jawbone of a recently slain donkey. I picked it up and destroyed one thousand Philistines with it. I was a one-man army. Then I said, With the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've destroyed a thousand men. When I finished my boasting, I threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. After this great feat, I became a judge. You see, I belong to a group of people in history called judges. But this does not accurately reflect the meaning of my job. In Hebrew, the word means troubleshooters. So you can say, 
I belong to a select few whose mission was to save God's people from themselves and others. A judge is described in terms of their accomplishments. Now, I am about to embark on one of the most dangerous missions ever attempted. I judged Israel for 20 years. During this period, the Philistines still dominated the land. After that, I traveled to Gaza, where I saw a prostitute and subsequently had relations with her. The Gazites overheard someone saying, Samson has come here. So they surrounded the place and waited all night at the gate of the city to ambush me. They kept quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is light, we will kill him. But I lay resting there until midnight, at which point I got up, grabbed hold of the doors of the city gate and the two doorposts, hauled them up, security bar and all, and put them on my shoulders before carrying them up to the top of the hill that is directly across from Hebron. These were not typical gates that I carried. Chariots needed to be able to pass through the gates of important fortifications, hence those gates had to be sufficiently wide. The gates themselves were comprised of a pair of wooden double doors, in order to prevent an adversary from entering with ease. The doors had to be composed of heavy boards. They were barred on the side by means of a heavy horizontal beam sliding through slots in the doorposts. The doors were braced by wooden posts, the outside of which pivoted in stone sockets. The gates of Gaza that I pulled out of their sockets and hoisted onto my shoulders weighed at least 400 or 500 pounds, about 200 kilograms. After all this, you might think I have learned all my lessons, but I gave in to temptation again, and my choices covered with pride would lead me down a treacherous path. It was during one of my journeys that I encountered Delilah, a woman whose beauty could ensnare even the most steadfast of souls. Her cunning seduced me, and I, blinded by my desires, gave in. I fell in love again and fell for a woman completely wrong for me. I wanted to be used by God, but I also yielded to the deceitfulness of sin. I kept the external features of my Nazarite vow zealously, while at the same time sitting blatantly with a prostitute. I did what we nearly all do when deceived by sin. I put my life into categories and figured that there were some categories God cared about and some categories God did not care about. I was once again in the Philistine territories and the rulers were out for blood. The rulers of the Philistines saw an opportunity to capture me and extinguish the flame of rebellion that burned within my heart. So, they went to Delilah and offered 1,100 pieces of silver to her. Delilah was also deeply in love, but she was in love with money. 1,100 shekels made up more than 140 pounds 63 kilograms of silver. She took them up on this offer. So she said to me, Please, tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. I replied, If I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, I would become as weak as anyone else. So, she tied me up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house, and she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. 
But I snapped the bowstrings as a piece of string snaps when it is burned by a fire. So the secret of my strength was not discovered. Afterward, she said to me, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now, please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Delilah knew that I was strong, yet she also knew that I could be bound by something. And this was indeed true. I replied, If I were tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. So she took new ropes and tied me up with them. The men were hiding in the inner room as before, and again she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But again, I snapped the ropes from my arms as if they were thread. Then Delilah said, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. I replied, If you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric on your loom and tighten it with a loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. So, while I slept, she wove the seven braids of my hair into the fabric. Then she tightened it with the loom shuttle. Again she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But I woke up, pulled back the loom shuttle and yanked my hair away from the loom and the fabric. She pouted. How can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented me with her nagging day after day, until I was sick to death of it. Finally, I shared my secret with her. My hair has never been cut, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. She realized I had finally told her the truth, so she sent for the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, for he has finally told me his secret. So, the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands, Delilah lulled me to sleep with my head in her lap, and then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of my hair. In this way, she began to bring me down, and my strength left me. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When I woke up, I thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But I didn't realize the Lord had left me. I didn't know things were different. I lived in compromise for so long that I thought it would never make a difference. At that moment, my strength vanished, leaving me at the mercy of those who sought my demise. Bound by chains, a once mighty man reduced to a mere man, I could only watch as my captors reveled in their triumph. So the Philistines captured me and took out my very eyes. I would never see the light of day for the rest of my life. This was indeed a cruel judgment of the Philistines. It is ironic that I was first blinded in my imprisonment. I was attracted to ungodly relationships through my eyes. My failure to restrain this attraction to women brought me into this bondage. I insisted on the freedom of doing what I wanted to do. This left me with no freedom 
at all. Sin has its wages, and this was my payday. My sin left me blind, in bondage, and an enslaved person. Before my blindness, bondage and slavery were only inward, but they eventually became evident outwardly. They took me to Gaza, where I was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. Now, I am here imprisoned, blinded and humiliated, but I have found solace in the remnants of my faith. Within the depths of my darkest hour, I call upon the Lord God, seeking one final surge of strength to exact vengeance upon my enemies. God gave me hope in the midst of a dungeon. I put my hand to my head and felt that it was getting bristly, and then I put my hand to my beard and found it rough. Yes, 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 it was coming. It will be all right soon. I shall not get my eyes back. They will not grow again. My hair has begun to grow back. My sin has made me a miserable loser. But I will get my strength back again because my hair is growing. I shall be able to strike a blow for my people and for my God yet. The Philistine rulers are holding a great festival, offering sacrifices and praising their God, Dagon. They said, Our God has given us victory over our enemy, Samson. Dagon, also known as Dagon, was one of the oldest deities in Mesopotamia, and he was represented as a half-man, half-fish creature. The god Dagon was regarded as the father of all other gods, so he was worshipped widely in what we call the Cradle of Civilization, where farming is thought to have first started, also the area some call the Fertile Crescent. Dagon's statue looked like a gigantic man. Some representations of him have him looking like a merman, which is a human with fish features below the waist. Some scholars have referred to him as a fish god, which makes sense given his association with the Philistines and their location along the coast. The Philistines continued to worship Dagon during my time. Dagon's son, Baal, was worshipped in a variety of ways across the entire land. Dagon was worshipped in temples that could be found all over Mesopotamia. According to the Bible, the cities of Beth Dagon, Gaza, and Ashdod were home to some of the most important temples. He was worshipped by offerings and participating in feasts. When the people saw me, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. The followers of Dagon communicated a straightforward message to everyone on earth. They responded with, our God is stronger than the God of Israel, because we have conquered Samson. My disobedience has led others to deny God. Half drunk by now, the people have demanded, Bring out Samson so he can amuse us. So I was brought out of the prison to amuse them and they had me stand between the pillars supporting the roof. The Philistines continued to mock me. At this large demonstration, they used a boy to guard me. I asked the young servant who was leading me by the hand, 
Place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Now the temple is completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers are here, and there are men and women on the roof who are watching me. I am praying to the Lord God. Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. This is it. The end of the road for me. My chance at redemption. I wanted to be used by God, but I also yielded to the deceitfulness of sin. I am putting my hands on the two center pillars that hold up the temple. Pushing against them with both hands, I pray. Let me die with the Philistines. My story, while filled with heroic deeds and extraordinary feats, serves as a cautionary tale. It reminds us that strength, both physical and spiritual, should be wielded with wisdom and tempered by humility. It warns against the allure of temptation and the consequences of succumbing to one's desires. But most importantly, it speaks of redemption. For even in my downfall, I found the strength to triumph and fulfill my destiny. My name is Samson, and this is my story.